Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Alexandra Bogdanovic, the president of University of Belgrade SP student chapter. Uh, we have a Berna Hoskak here, if I pronounced it correctly, here with us today. Uh, she is the associate professor of petroleum engineering of Flowtech Industries Incorporated Career Development Professor and Director of the Heavy Oil, Oil Shales, Oil Sands and Carbonate Analysis and Recovery Methods Research Team at Texas A&M University. Uh, and without further ado, I will let Bernard take the lead. Just I will add that you can ask uh, questions if you have any during the presentation, uh, just raise your hand or you can ask uh, at the end of the presentation, just uh, put a mark on the number of the slides you want to ask your question to. That's all, Berna. Okay, thank you, uh, Alexandra. Let's see if I will be able to now. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm uh, by training both environmental engineer and petroleum engineer. And I believe that uh, right now I will discuss this uh, topic fairly, uh, but this is a kind of a really controversial topic. Uh, everybody is just avoiding to talk about, and uh, we are always trying to blame petroleum engineers as an environmental engineer and as a, as a petroleum engineer. Let's see who to blame for the gas emissions due to oil and gas production. So uh, I would like to just give briefly outline of my talk. Uh, first of all, uh, what petroleum engineers responsible as gas emissions we will talk about then gas emissions due to oil and gas consumption and impact of gas emissions on climate change and the historical data on gas emissions and then I will conclude my presentation. So we will start with the uh, petroleum engineers uh, portion contribution to gas emissions. Okay, so we are in general mixing up uh, oil and gas consumption with oil and gas production. Before I start my talk, I would like to be 100% sure that everybody knows the difference. So you are seeing right now here uh, the voyage of petroleum. Uh, petroleum is getting explored and then going all the way through here and uh, we are using petroleum in our houses. Uh, regardless, we are petroleum engineers or uh, non-petroleum engineers. And uh, petroleum engineers are the ones who are producing oil and gas, and we will mainly discuss uh, the uh, gas emissions due to uh, oil and gas production uh, first. Okay, And while I'm talking about oil and gas production, I'm talking about upstream, and as a petroleum engineer, I'm responsible till here. From this point on, it is the consumption of petroleum and first we will concentrate on here and we will not go in many details for this section because uh, you're looking for our contribution as petroleum engineers uh, to uh, gas emissions and uh, we are petroleum engineers are upstream guys so we are upstream people we are producing exploring the oil and producing petroleum and during this uh, voyage, uh, what are the contributors to gas emissions? And in this voyage, while uh, I'm doing uh, my job as a petroleum engineer, uh, where I am causing emissions? Let's see. First is exploration and production. The second is flaring and venting. And the third uh, contributor is fugitive emissions uh, during oil and gas production. So while I'm talking about those things, I want you to take, uh, I want you to be aware that every gas has different impact on the environment. So carbon dioxide has different impact, methane has different impact. If I will just put down uh, carbon dioxide impact and methane impact in the same level, then I would not really uh, represent the problem in a big picture. So uh, because these are apples and pears, you cannot compare apples and pears. You need to convert them in a kind of a uh, one unique uh, unit. So 
uh, instead of just mentioning carbon dioxide, methane, because their impacts are different, we need to mention something unique uh, that we can understand and convert and normalize their impact in one unit. And this is known as global warming potential. So instead of like saying uh, the impact of carbon dioxide or impact of methane, we will discuss their impact on global warming and it is known as global warming potential. And this terminology is coming uh, from EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And what is uh, the meaning of global warming potential? This potential is a measure of how much energy the emissions of one ton of a gas will absorb over a given period of time relative to the emission of one ton of carbon dioxide according to EPA. So from now on, I am normalizing my data, regardless I'm maybe producing methane, but I'm converting that methane production to the impact of carbon dioxide. So why I'm doing that? Because according to EPA, it's global warming potential. The carbon dioxide global warming potential is one. However, methane is higher, nitrous oxide are higher, and chlorofluorocarbons are much, much, much more higher. And their impact is changing in years in the atmosphere, okay? So carbon dioxide is showing a kind of a regular trend, but methane impact is getting reduced in time, and the other gases as well getting reduced in time. So we will be converting from now on methane impact into carbon dioxide and we will sum them up uh, in terms of carbon dioxide their impact okay from now on so let's return back our uh, gas emission sources uh, due to oil and gas production the first one is exploration and production we said and as petroleum engineers uh, we are doing a really very difficult job we are producing petroleum in the middle of nowhere there is no electricity and there is no human being nearby. Think about that. In a de desert, you are trying to produce oil. You don't have electricity there. And think about you are in the Arctic. Uh, you are in the offshore. There is no electricity in those uh, places. But you need electricity to power the facilities that you are living in as petroleum engineer. Uh, you cannot go home from here you need to leave there so there are some facilities for you to live inside and how you can power those facilities there is no electricity so how you are powering them by what you are producing so you are producing oil and you are burning it to generate electricity to power the facilities on site what else actually you need also electricity to power the pumps, the compressors to power the steam generators, okay? So also for those kind of things, uh, you are using electricity. So during uh, exploration and production, not only because of the oil production, but by burning the oil, you have also contribution to the gas emissions. And let's see those contributions. So this number, which is uh, around 6.5, uh, billion uh, metric tons uh, carbon dioxide is generated annually in the United States based, based on 2015 data. And that much of the carbon dioxide uh, is emitted just because of exploration and production in the United States in the same year. And this contributes from the total 1.87% uh, of the total carbon dioxide. As I mentioned you before, this carbon dioxide actually has in it methane as well, okay, other components as well. But I'm converting all the gases into carbon dioxide so I can have one meaningful number and then I can understand the, the total impact uh, better. So as I mentioned you before, this exploration and production uh, covers the emission coming from the uh, facility powering surface and subsurface facilities and in general it's emitting carbon dioxide okay and when we when i'm checking during exploration and production i'm seeing the high contribution 
coming from the drilling and completion, uh, surface facility constructions, production management, uh, and several possible leakage during exploration and production. And we are done with the exploration and production, and we also learn that the total carbon dioxide emissions, when I'm comparing the carbon dioxide emissions in the United States, it is just 1.87% of that total carbon dioxide emission. And the second one is flaring and venting. Actually, this is the most uh, this is the portion that is taking most attention and everybody is saying flaring is not good, don't, don't flare it and let's see which one is uh, worse. So we are producing a lot of gas. If you know pressure, volume and temperature relationship in the, la uh, in the reservoir and in the surface, you should know that the gas that you are having in the reservoir is not occupying the same place at the surface. So because gases are expanding and uh, in the reservoir condition, they are compact, but when they come to the surface at atmospheric pressure, it's really not easy to handle that much gas at the surface, especially if you cannot find a market, immediate market, to sell that gas that you are producing, what you will do with that gas. You produce a lot of gas and your surface facilities are not sufficient enough to uh, store them uh, in the middle of nowhere in the oil field. And what you need to do with the excessive amount of gas, they are flaring it, okay? And they are converting it into carbon dioxide. Or they are venting it, which means that without converting it into carbon dioxide, they are just, the oil companies are just venting it to the atmosphere which contains not only carbon dioxide, but also methane. And we learned that methane has higher impact than uh, carbon dioxide on the, uh, on the uh, environmentally, uh, much more dangerous. So let's see the flaring and venting impact. So what we are seeing here, uh, first of all, the definition of flaring and venting, as I mentioned, if there's no market and what we need to do, uh, we can re-inject back to the reservoir as an enhanced oil recovery fluid because the gases that we are injecting underground as an enhanced oil recovery method are also uh, petroleum products. Uh, but it might be really too high, too costly, okay? And we may not need that much gas to inject under the ground. And what they are doing, they are flaring it. And you are seeing here the U.S. map night vision uh, and you are seeing very uh, highly populated uh, cities and you can see in the night vision they are just burning which means that they have a lot of lights because this is like New York around New York area and a, a lot of lights you can see but while we are just taking closer look to this area there is not a big city in here so they are not electricity actually this is due to flaring in the Bacon area. So Bacon is a shale formation and they are flaring in this area the excessive amount of gas and it took a lot of attention uh, because of this image. It took a lot of attention and they started to say, don't flare. But the, there is, there sh we should also propose a solution if they will not flare and if it will not be visible during night, then most probably they are venting. Do we want them to vent as well? It is worse than flaring because the carbon dioxide is less, uh, has less impact than uh, methane to the environment. So if they will produce that much of gas, if they cannot stop, I will prefer as an environmental engineer and as a petroleum engineer, I will prefer them to flare it rather than venting it. And let's check the total impact due to flaring and venting. So uh, during flaring and venting in 2015, uh, United States emitted uh, 84 million metric ton of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it is 
uh, it corresponds to 1.28% of the total carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. Okay, and we are done with this too, and I'm writing down their impact when we are checking the uh, U.S. carbon dioxide emissions, and now we are with the fugitive emissions. And during exploration of uh, production, we petroleum engineers are using a lot of pipe pipes to transport the produced oil and gas from one location to another location. And we are thinking that we are uh, we are having perfect, we can have perfect pipes. There is not such a thing perfect pipe, okay? In every case, uh, we have leaks all the time. And fugitive emissions are due to those leaks. You can make it better and better. You can reduce the fugitive emissions as much as possible, but it is uh, nearly impossible to make them zero, okay? And we have a lot of fugitive emissions and they are unexpected. They are not intentionally, okay, done. And uh, there might be also some accidental uh, emissions because of the blowouts, because of the leakage through the well bore, or because maybe the, you injected a lot of fluid under the ground and you break, you cause the break through the uh, cap rock. And then from the cap rock, the fractures cause some leakage through the geologic formation as well. And this is also dangerous like venting because it emits uh, methane. Methane is dangerous, more, much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. And when we are checking the total impact of fugitive emissions uh, for 2015, what we are seeing, 30 million uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide has been released due to fugitive emissions in 2015, and its contribution to total carbon dioxide emission is 0.45 uh, percentage. Okay, so we learn the each portion uh, due to oil and gas production. Now let's sum them up to see what is the contribution of oil and gas production to gas emissions in the United States. It is 3.6% uh, anyway. Okay, uh, due to, and I'm I'm converting methane also in, into carbon dioxide, and this number is in terms of carbon dioxide. And the other sources then, 33.6% uh, is coming due to oil and gas production and rest is coming from where? The rest is coming from the electricity and heat production building, transportation and other industry. And the uh, 3.6 is here, right here in the other, uh, other energy portion, okay? According to EPA classification. Okay, so uh, this is the contribution of oil and gas industry, oil and gas production. And when we are just checking the contribution of each item, we are seeing the main contributors, exploration and production. And then the second is coming, flaring and venting. And the third one is fugitive emissions. Okay, we are done with the emissions due to oil and uh, emissions uh, due to oil and gas production. Now we will review the emissions due to oil and gas consumption. Okay. So for the oil and gas consumption, uh, what we need to know that who to blame first, okay, who is consuming more the oil and gas. So who is consuming more? <laughs> For sure, the United States is number one as a consumer, and the European Union countries are number two. So uh, you are in Europe, and I'm in yeah, I'm United States right now. So who to blame? Both of us, okay? And then China uh, is coming in the third place. And who to blame? Should we blame China, or we are using made in China products a lot? So everybody, we need to uh, actually blame everybody about this consumption. OK, so the world consumption is really increasing a lot and this contribution to carbon dioxide emissions will increase in the in the future as well. Maybe we put a pause this year on oil consumption uh, because of the pandemic, 
but uh, the the next years uh, we will just uh, continue to consume more and more oil and gas. And then the question is, I'm using it for what reason? Actually, we are using it for the energy generation. And when we are just checking the other energy resources that uh, I can just generate energy, uh, renewable energies, nuclear energy, apart from the fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil, which are causing a lot of carbon, which are, which are uh, resulted in carbon fit footprints, they, their uh, development is uh, ramp up, and I hope in the future we will see more energy generation uh, from the renewables and nuclear sources as well. As a petroleum engineer, I'm not saying that we should rely on only oil uh, because we are growing in population and in the future we will need more and more energy. And it is always good to do research on uh, different energy sources and reliable uh, energy sources that we can rely in, not infinite energy sources, uh, not finite energy sources, but infinite energy sources like renewable energy. Uh, th that's why I'm I'm in favor of renewable and I'm in favor of nuclear as well, because we will need in the future all of them. Okay, and the electricity source when we are just checking uh, the fossil fuels, I would like to understand more about the as a petroleum engineer how much uh, of the gas that I'm producing is getting converted into electricity. So you are seeing here the electricity generation uh, based on different sources in the United States and renewables are 15%. Uh, we have liquid petroleum here and gas petroleum here and the coal here and the nuclear sources here. Okay, so the electricity generation is 35% of the gas is getting consumed for electricity generation and the rest is mainly getting consumed by heating purposes. And we are consuming electricity where? Actually, we are consuming electricity in our daily life for domestic appliance uses. And uh, because, uh, of, because electricity is coming from a uh, carbon source, coming from a fossil fuel, then we have also carbon dioxide emissions. When we are turning on the lights in our, uh, in our houses, we are uh, using a computer when we are cooking, uh, when we are cleaning the house, and while I'm giving this talk as well, and while you are listening to me, uh, because you are consuming us electricity. And what we are seeing, because uh, our lives are getting more and more and more comfortable with the use of these domestic appliances, the carbon dioxide footprint due to the use of those appliances are getting increased because we are consuming electricity and we are highly dependent on our comfortable lives. And the other thing, the electricity I would like to take your attention is the automotive case. And here I'm just comparing uh, the electricity, uh, electric car with luxury cars that they are using uh, petroleum uh, and a small car which is using again petroleum and I'm trying to compare their carbon dioxide emissions uh, per kilometer and fuel consumption uh, per 100 kilometer and I'm also comparing the flights so uh, if you are taking flights or if you are taking a kind of uh, uh, public transportation, you still have carbon footprint because of the fuel consumption. But we would like to know also if I'm using an electric car, do I have still a carbon footprint or not? OK, uh, when I'm checking this, what I'm seeing for United States case as uh, the carbon footprint of an electric car is this much. OK, so it is more than a small car. Uh, and this small car that uh, most of the European countries are using small cars. And this is a little bit bigger than those small cars that we made the uh, in here. And you are seeing this is uh, contributing also the carbon dioxide emissions, but this is an electric car. So how come? 
uh, it can contribute to carbon dioxide emissions because the electricity is coming from the fossil fuel and it is getting centralized in the United States and getting distributed from the center. And we need to be aware that this electricity has a carbon footprint as well. Okay. And what else? Where else I'm using petroleum? I'm using it for transportation, as we discussed uh, through the automotive case, and this is causing some pollution. And also, we are using it for the petrol chemical industry. Okay, gas, even for the gas petroleum, I have a small portion that I'm uh, converting it to petrochemicals. And for the liquid petroleum, I'm using more for petrochemicals. And those petrochemicals are the chemicals that we are using in our daily lives. The soap that we are cleaning our hands to protect ourselves from coronavirus is a petroleum product. And also the roads are petroleum product. The uh, car itself is a petroleum product. Most of the parts in the car and uh, my mouse is a petroleum product, my keyboard, my camera. Uh, so because of petroleum, you can see me. The, the cables are made from petroleum, right? And the clothes are made from petroleum. Many clothes are made from petroleum. So not only the petroleum production, but the petroleum conversion into a transportation liquid, into petrochemical products are causing also uh, gas emissions. And this is a refinery picture, okay? And the refinery, uh, we are converting petroleum into usable daily life products. And we have many footprints of the uh, refineries as well. Okay, so we reviewed also gas consumption. Oil and gas consumption is causing gas emissions, a uh, significant amount of gas emissions. Let's check impact of gas emissions, this gas emissions due to fossil fuel production and consumption on climate change. So first of all, we need to understand what is climate. Uh, there's another misconception that we are mixing up climate with weather. So we are seeing today is sunny and tomorrow is suddenly the temperature is dropping. And we are thinking about that, the climate change. No, it is just weather, okay? While we're talking about climate and weather, we should understand that climate is a long time frame, frame effect and the weather is short time frame effect, okay? It can be local or global. And the, we shouldn't mix up climate change with the global warming. And the global warming is just a consequence of the climate change. And the global warming means that on average temperature increase at the Earth's surface and in the ocean, but locally, warming or cooling can be observed. Let's say uh, here I'm having like uh, hot summers, uh, but uh, let's say in other areas can have really cold, uh, cold summer. Okay, and they may think that they were talking about global warming, but we are having a colder winter, okay, colder summer here. But I'm having here hot uh, summer and hot winter. When you check the average temperature of the earth, it's increasing. But locally, your temperature might be decreasing because my temperature is increasing extremely. That's why the overall impact is showing me that the globally I'm observing a warming, okay? And this actually scientifically proven as well that the earth temperature is steadily increasing and this steady increase is overlapping with the carbon dioxide emissions and here is the earth picture taken uh, by nasa in time and what you are seeing that the earth is getting red and red more red which means that the the surface of the earth is getting, uh, the temperature of the earth is getting increased in years. So global warming is real. So I'd like to remind you again that uh, the global warming potential, and we are always taking the base case carbon dioxide, and we are normalizing all of the gases to carbon dioxide. But I would like to know more about the factors affecting the global uh, warming and the greenhouse gases main influencing factor is anthropogenic factor. It's because of me, because of the 
my uh, consumption to to carbon carbon resources to fossil fuel resources i am consuming fossil fuel and i'm causing uh, an increase in the earth temperature and the consequence is not increasing in earth temperature but ice sheet volume change and then the temperature of the earth is changing and the sea level also is changing uh, in earth and the concern is like the temperature will increase one to six degrees uh, on earth and which means that this is an average number by uh, uh, 2100 and the sea level will increase in some, some area 0 0.4 meters to three meters okay and the uh, the main reason is global, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and we have already reviewed those greenhouse gases in terms of global warming potential. Okay, so I would like to go into detail about the greenhouse gases, and there's a misconception about the greenhouse gases, and we are saying that we need to blame water, because the main greenhouse gas is water. It is true. The main greenhouse gas is water vapor, and uh, as you can see, it is keeping uh, the uh, the sunlight to to go back. Uh, but uh, it's not the only uh, gas. Uh, we have high amount of carbon dioxide. We have methane and the other uh, other sources as well, greenhouses. While the greatest contributor is water, because its impact is not changing in time. However, carbon dioxide is changing, methane is changing, so we, we shouldn't concentrate on the water, but we should be concentrating on these this components, and we should redraw our pie chart by excluding water. But we will keep in our mind that water is also greenhouse gas. And as you can see, the main contributor is carbon dioxide coming from the fossil fuel. However, carbon dioxide is also coming from the forestry and land use, okay? Not only uh, fossil fuel production and consumption, but also the forestry as well. And uh, we also already reviewed that methane is much more dangerous than, uh, than carbon dioxide. And uh, the other gases, uh, we are not focusing here because the, in petroleum, uh, production, we are not seeing uh, those gases uh, emitted to the atmosphere. So we are done with the impact of gas emissions on climate change as well. So I would like to go into detail the, date, the historic data on gas emissions because I'm hearing a lot of misconception on that as well. So what I'm hearing that carbon dioxide is changing always in geologic time, and it's true. It always changed a lot. The carbon dioxide levels of Earth has been changing a lot, and it has happening in million years like that. And this is the current time, okay, zero, and this is the geologic time. And while I'm just checking this, I'm seeing a big error range as well, okay. And uh, as you can imagine, this this data shouldn't be that much easy to collect. And this is the ratio between current uh, and the previous uh, atmospheric conditions, okay? Current means 1997 carbon dioxide concentration. And while I'm checking here, I would like to know how fast the carbon dioxide was changing. I'm seeing that it was changing, but the scale is too big. It's a million years, okay? I would like to see how fast it was changing. And what I'm seeing, this is the fastest change that I'm seeing as a slope here. And even in the error range, I'm seeing that slope. The fastest change is 0 0.007 ppm per 50 years. In geologic time, this was the fastest carbon dioxide change in the atmosphere. And let's check current situation. In the current situation, this scale is years. This is million years and this is years. And right now it is 80 ppm per 50 years. It has been changed a lot, as you can see. Okay, so from 0 0.007 to 80 ppm. Here, the, uh, I mean, there were a lot of living organisms. 
they could adapt their lungs to this this change but can we adapt our lungs to this change it will change a lot as well okay in the uh, coming uh, years uh, are we ready our lungs are ready to this change this is the question that we need to ask ourselves now i would like to conclude my talk after i reviewed all of the misconceptions uh, i hope uh, you 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 didn't have those misconceptions but if you had those misconceptions as well you cleared them out and here in the conclusion what we said oil and gas production responsible in the united states around 3.6 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions and the single ratio can be also reasonably accepted world worldwide and when we come what we can do actually how we can reduce our footprints more uh, by uh, just trying to mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions and the consequences uh, how we can do that by reducing the oil and gas production and consumption are we ready are the technology is ready uh, can we produce uh, my clothes from sun <laughs> okay so we are really highly dependent on carbon inside the uh, site oil not as an energy source uh, only but also uh, as a carbon source we need uh, this this product and we need to diversify the energy which means that we, sh we shouldn't oppose to renewable energy we shouldn't oppose to nuclear energy as long as we are uh, doing our uh, engineering calculations properly we can do everything safer even the nuclear can be safe and uh, much more beneficial and if you would continue with oil and gas and <laughs> we will continue with oil and gas we will not sacrifice our comfortable lives and we means not only petroleum engineers but everybody now how we can mit mitigate its emissions we can do more carbon dioxide sequestration projects and this is also uh, part of petroleum engineers job petroleum engineers are using carbon dioxide as an enhanced oil recovery uh, fluid and they can inject to recover more oil and for the uh, sequestration of carbon dioxide as well petroleum engineers are the experts on the underground storage uh, because we know underground ground more and the best when comparing the other uh, other engineering disciplines and we can use less catalytic converter uh, which will produce more pollution and we can uh, do some research on uh, really crazy uh, ideas about cooling the world that something like space umbrella tin particles in the upper atmosphere can be also considered to mitigate uh, the emissions effect so this is all about my talk and I would like to thank to my uh, Master of Engineering student uh, in the preparation of this presentation. Uh, Oliver uh, is right now a, a reservoir engineer uh, in total in France. And uh, if you have any question, I'm, I'm glad to answer and uh, address all of them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentations. You. Sure. Uh, do we have a question from audience? In the uh, meantime, um, I do have a question. Sure. Uh, so there are uh, companies, US companies, with a net zero policy. And um, what are the consequences for US uh, considering that they escaped the Paris Agreement? <laughs> Okay, so this is a little bit like politics, right? So we are escaping all the time to to answer those uh, those kind of things. I think our president has been changed. I believe uh, they their new policy will be different than the previous one. And what Biden is saying, President Biden, uh, I believe he, we we will uh, we will take our precautions. Uh, for the climate change in the United States, I believe. For the zero uh, emissions, it's a kind of a very optimistic, to be honest with you. I hope everybody can achieve it. 
uh, but uh, it is just a goal, okay? <laughs> so uh, we hope it would happen, uh, but I'm not that much optimistic <laughs> for the zero emissions because we are consuming a lot. All of us are consuming a lot. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I was doing a research paper and uh, one of my topics was EPA. So I wanted to ask you, is EPA dealing with emissions? Sure. Environmental Protection Agency is dealing with both the emissions and the... Uh, but uh, so you can find a lot of information on EPA website. So most of the information that we got here from uh, Environmental Protection Agency website. Uh, you, you can use it, uh, but don't forget that in the United States, uh, every state has their own uh, regulations as well. Uh, and the state by state regulations can change. They can take uh, uh, EPAS recommendations, <laughs> uh, but they may not as well. Uh, in, the same, in, the, in Texas and in, in the West Coast and the East Coast, the situation is different so the, it is a state decision mostly uh, not the federal government decision in the united states right thank you i don't know if anyone has a question they can ask it now we would like to hear some of you okay hello everyone i have one question Firstly, Bernard, thank you for your Hi. presentation. It was really nice. And my question is related to the fugitive emissions. How sure. do you how do you measure it? Is it possible to measure fugitive emissions? So that's a perfect question. Okay. As engineers, okay, we, we are all engineers, I hope, in here. Yeah. So course. as engineers, uh, we need to do our mass balance all the time. Okay. Uh, so while you are just uh, determining a reserve in the in the reservoir and at the surface, uh, so you know your mass. And while this mass is traveling through the pipes, uh, at, at the end you are getting another mass. If there is a difference between uh, and in the production point and in the transfer point, a difference in the mass uh, of that produced gas or produced oil, then the rest means that escaped uh, through the lakes. Okay, so this is uh, through the mass flow meters. We are we are doing it. If we it is if it is not visible like that. So let's say you are producing one million uh, stop tank barrel of, uh, of oil, and then you are just ending up not one million, but uh, let's say 999 and then the missing uh, is just because of the vegetative. Okay, I hope it is answering your question through the mass balance we are understanding. Yeah, yeah, sure. But also, for example, how you can measure the, the uh, inlet into, into the process, for example. Sometimes uh, it is it is not so uh, accurate. So most of the times, most probably, it's not that much accurate. Yeah. Uh, but this is the money source, okay? Uh, at the wellhead, uh, especially what I'm saying, uh, I'm teaching those kind of classes as well. I design classes how we can design. Uh, from the uh, from the reservoir to the surface, how we can make our designs possible. And while I'm lecturing them, uh, we are measuring everything everywhere. Okay, and in general, we are measuring in volumes, and then we are converting those volumes into masses to be on the safe side because there's not a volume balance. Uh, so, uh, in theory. <laughs> And the lecturing, uh, as petroleum engineers, as any engineers, we need to do always our mass balance calculations. We need to always know how much we are producing in each step. So we have a lot of meters, like uh, gas meters, and uh, from the pressure and volume changes, you can easily 
uh, understand uh, from wellhead to other place how the mass is changing. You can, if as long as you know the volume and the pressure at different two locations, you can apply different equations uh, like Bernoulli, let's say, and then you can calculate how mass is changing uh, from one location to another. In general, what we know that how much oil we will uh, produce and how much oil we are producing in the well hat. And that oil that we are producing or the gas that we are producing, if it is not ended of the same mass while it is traveling to the end, then the difference is fugitive for sure. Yeah, for but for example, if you have a, a multi multi phase inflow, you have a oil and gas in the same time on the well head. And for your calculation, you need actually the uh, composition for for that yes. fluid. Yeah, and yes. It, yeah, and how do you how do you, for example, uh, do, uh, how to say that? So if you don't have the composition yeah. data, how you are calculating it? Okay, this is a class that I'm teaching. It is called reservoir fluids, and the code code is three ten here. And Dr. McCain, uh, who recently passed away, has a book on uh, petroleum properties. So in this in this book, you can see that if you have the full data about what you are producing, you can do really precise calculations. And if you know your uh, reservoir is a, a volatile oil, uh, uh, black oil, uh, wet gas, uh, dry gas, whatever, five different types of uh, reservoirs. And then uh, you can do all of your calculation based on uh, what is written in that book. And in that book also, there's another chapter. It is saying that if you don't have that information, let's say you don't know the composition, you don't know a lot of things about the reservoir, what you will do based on the experiences, uh, what they have formed, they have formed a lot of charts for those kind of reservoirs. And for those kind of reservoirs, you are using uh, pressure data uh, to estimate the solution gas in place, RS in place, and you're reading from those graphs uh, what kind of, how much gas you have before reaching the bubble point and after, after bubble point. And uh, these, these are presented with the charts and those charts are reliable because uh, they have been formed uh, by using like around 500 or more than 500 reservoir information. And, uh, but if you are talking about unconventionals, that's we are dealing right now in the United States a lot. It's a big question. It's a big, very big question right now with the unconventional. Those uh, charts are not available for unconventional, so we need to be very careful while we are dealing with the unconventional. It will be very difficult to find that fugitive emissions for the unconventional reservoirs. All right, but the conventional reservoir, we have that information. You can find it from Dr. McCain's book. If you have the data, if you don't have the data, uh, you you can easily find uh, that information by using charts. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Sure. No problem. Anyone else? Yes. Well. I guess this means we don't have any questions, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Berna. This was a great presentation. Thank you so it much. It was a pleasure. Sure, thanks a lot for the opportunity as well. Okay. Yes. I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> yes, I, I will be happier if I will get more questions. Like the last one, I, I enjoyed a lot to answer that question. <laughs> and I can give also PVT related lecture la later if you want. <laughs> well, our students are a bit shy, so. They, so uh, uh, as an instructor, what I will tell you, if you are getting questions, it means that 
uh, audience enjoyed uh, the, the to topic a lot. So I, I would prefer to get more and more questions. <laughs> okay. And uh, for the uh, for the uh, shy students, what I can say, these are really good um, good platforms to interact with different people. And so uh, it, it is good to know a person, but it is better if a lot of people know you. OK, uh, so in order to be recognized, in order to be known by different people, you need to speak out more and more. And what I'm seeing from Alexandra, uh, she has a really good self-confidence. I hope that everybody can build a similar self-confidence <laughs> because you can be uh, better in the future while you're interacting with different people. OK, thanks a lot again, Alexandra. For the Thank you very much. It was a I pleasure. I enjoyed it as well. Sure. OK. <laughs> Thank you.